Amen. Amen. Why don't you guys open your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Today we're, um, we're looking at this continuation of Jesus' battle with all the different religious groups. Of course, we're, we're in, in the life of Christ and in this timeline. This is the last week of his earthly ministry. And last week we saw him uh, being questioned by the Herodians and the Pharisees. We have these succession of interactions that he has with the religious people, with the religious leaders. Last week it was a little more political. Today it's a little more religious, I guess, in nature as he has a, a question that comes to him from the Sadducees. The Sadducees were a, a, a sect of the Jews that were um, highly educated, but at the same time completely ignorant, as we'll see, uh, pertaining to the things of God. And so what we're going to see, what we're going to talk about is, uh, as, as we look at their question to him, we're going to be able to kind of talk about false doctrine, false beliefs. And they come to him with a question, but the whole thing, the foundation of it is a, is a false belief that they hold. When I was a kid, uh, you know, I, I have this memory. Some of you may have similar memories, but I remember my mother had certain things that she would say. Of course, I, my dad was always working, and so as a young guy, I, I spent more time with my mom, maybe picked up more things that she said. But I remember there was this one thing that my mom would say. Uh, we'd be driving down the road or something, and, and whenever there would be some kind of a, a dangerous situation, we've all seen it where, where a young kid darts across the road or, or, you know, there's some kind of crazy thing going on. My mom would always say this, that's how they make angels. Seriously, I, I heard it, you know, over and over and over again. Not, certainly not every day, but, but I heard it repeatedly as a young guy. You know, in this kind of, you know, motherly, you know, alarm and scorn. And, and I think I heard it enough to where as a young guy, I began to kind of believe it. Even I know at some point I said it. Oh, don't you just hate that, that moment in your life when you sound like your parents? I'll never forget raising our daughters. There was this moment, the moment in time when I, I remember I was tucking them in or whatever, and I, would say, I barked at them. I said, I'll roll over and go to sleep. And I was like, no, I've just become my father. I hated it when he said that. I always thought, why do I have to roll over? But he'd always say, roll over and go to sleep. It's like, okay, is there something magical about roll? Anyway. So, but my mom, she said this thing, that's how they make angels. And I, I even repeated it myself. It's kind of like in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, you know, that classic, the Frank Capra holiday classic. I have to call it a holiday classic. I think first service I referred to it as a Christmas classic. It's a holiday classic. It has nothing to do with Christmas, really. It's, according to the American Film Institute, it's the number one inspirational film ever made. And yet, if you know anything about the movie, you've, we've seen it, we've all seen it, right? It is filled with misinformation from a doctrinal standpoint. It's filled with misinformation. You know, the kind of the, the classic thing is, oh, the bell rings, oh, an angel gets its wings. You guys know that's not true, right? It's just not true. They just made that up out of whole cloth. I don't, I don't know, you know, what the whole idea was behind it. It was a vehicle maybe to tell their story, but it was filled with all kinds of misinformation, false doctrine. Now you think, whoa, that's kind of uptight. Yeah, it is a little uptight because this has to do with spiritual matters. And we have to be really careful with spiritual matters, right? We want to have accurate doctrine, true doctrine, now, I've, just, I've been throwing out that word doctrine. It needs to be defined. Doctrine, it's the teaching. It's our understanding of God. It's all the information that we hold on to and that we believe to be true in regard to our faith. That's doctrine, that's belief. And my job is to teach doctrine from the scripture, right? That's, that's what I do, that's my job. And it's important for us, it's important for me, and it should be important for all of us as Christians to hold on to true, correct doctrine and to actually reject false doctrine. Can I get an amen? 
So we want to we want to do that. Now this particular episode we're picking up in Mark chapter 12 verse 18. This occasion is a question now that comes from as I said before the Sadducees. Now pick up with me verse 18. We're going to read verse 18 through 27. And then next week we'll get on to a question that the scribes have. But the Sadducees come to him and it says, Some Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection came to Jesus and began questioning him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. There were seven brothers and the first took a wife and died leaving no children. The second one married her and died leaving behind no children and the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. One could almost hear the tone now change. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. And Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are mistaken, that you do not understand the Scripture or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the burning bush how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. Wow. The the Sadducees, they come to Jesus with this question, and it's a nonsensical question, right? It's, it's a, it's a made-up story, right? And they, they present this whole thing. They say, listen, there are these seven brothers, and according to what Moses said, you know, if the, if the first brother dies, the second brother could marry the, the woman and, and so on and so forth. And so, This woman went through all the seven brothers. They all died. And then she died. And then who's going to be married to her in heaven? This is just like those silly kind of nonsensical scenarios that people like to present. You know, you've probably heard the classic, how many angels can stand on the head of a pen? You ever heard that before? It's like, what? People come up with stuff like that. Or the other one, uh, Can God create a rock so heavy that he can't lift it up? It's like, what? (laughs) It's, it's, It's just nonsense. And people come up with these kinds of things. Not because they want to know anything about God, because they, they want to pose some conundrum, some thing in which intellectually you just can't get out of it. That's all these guys are looking to do with Jesus. They don't really want to learn anything. Their whole goal is to somehow trap him. In Really what they want to do is get him to say something against Moses, right? Or, or to somehow get entangled in their religious nonsense. Now, The question that they have is based in an Old Testament ordinance that Moses gave. In Deuteronomy 25, 5, he says this, When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as a wife and perform the duty of the husband's brother to her. Thank God this is not New Testament law. Amen? It's not. But it's prescriptive for the nation. This was put in place for the Jews for a particular purpose. It was to keep the family together. God wanted to establish that nation. And it was important as he sought to establish this, that nation that they wouldn't marry outside, but that they would kind of keep the family together and also to keep the family wealth. And so they take that and they've built this nonsensical question about it in order to trap Jesus in some argument, some discussion. We know that they have a bad motive. They have a a false motive. 
right? We, we kind of see it over and over again. We see it with the Pharisees. We see it with the Sadducees. We're going to see it with the scribes next week. They have a bad, they have an evil motive even. They don't, they don't desire to learn. They desire to trap. Now, you might say, well, how do you know they have an evil motive? Well, we know what these guys believe. That's kind of the issue is we already know. In fact, Mark tells us in verse 18, the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection. That's why they're so sad, you see. I know, you guys, this is a cheap one. I know, you've probably heard that before. They don't believe in the resurrection, yet they're posing to Jesus a question that presupposes the resurrection. So their motive isn't to learn. They already have rejected this doctrinally. And Acts chapter 23 tells us more about what they believe. It says in Acts 23, 8, the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And so you've got there in Acts 23, 8, the, the kind of the difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees as a religious group. They both believe in God. They believe in the God of Israel. They certainly believe the law, right? So they, we could just say they agree with the Old Testament, yet the Sadducees reject spiritual things apart from the identity of God. They don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in the angels. They don't believe in a spirit. And yet the question has all of those elements in it. And so Jesus responds to their question. And look at just the, the stark way in which he addresses their question. He doesn't, really, he doesn't really answer it so much as he tackles what's underlying the question and what's in their hearts. He says, you're mistaken, right? He doesn't say it once, he says it twice. There at the end, he says the same thing. He says, in verse 27, you're greatly mistaken. You're mistaken, you're greatly mistaken. And then he tells them why they're mistaken. They're mistaken, number one, because they do not understand the scriptures. Now, I would just say right there, there's a difference between knowing what the scripture says and understanding the scripture, right? There's, you can know the scriptures. We know people who know scriptures but don't understand the scriptures. It's totally possible. He says, secondly, you don't understand the power of God. You, you do not understand the power of God. And I would say, probably, you need to understand the power of God in order to have the scriptures revealed to you, right? You've, you've got to believe in a God of power, a God who has created, a God who has intervened in time and space. It's only through that belief, through the understanding the God of power or the power of God, that you can rightly and fully understand the scriptures. We're going to get to Jesus' answer in a bit. He does kind of give them an answer, and so from his answer, we'll understand uh, all the elements as far as marriage and heaven and the angels and all of that. But this exchange gives us an opportunity to take a look at false doctrine. And so in three ways, I want to look at, number one, how false doctrine is created. Where does it come from? Where does it begin? How is it embraced? All those things. So we're going to look at how doctrinal errors are created. The second thing is we're going to look at how doctrine is tested. Is there a standard by which we can look at a different teaching, this or that? My mother's teaching on the angels. You know, can you test it? And then finally, how, is, how are errors corrected? How will they be corrected in our lives and in the lives of others? So how are doctrinal error, errors created? Well, I want to give you guys uh, some kind of, uh, hopefully this is interesting for you. It's kind of a Bible college course, um, and it has to do with the matter of interpretation, how the Bible is interpreted and, and how it's taught. This is a Calvary Chapel church. This is our foundation. I was handed, uh, you know, from, from the, the lore of Calvary Chapel beginning back in, you know, the 60s with Pastor Chuck Smith and, and, and that method, although his method wasn't necessarily unique. But we've been given this method of teaching, which is called expositional, right? We go through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, to see what it says. Now, as we do that, there is... A, Two different methods by which the Bible is studied and taught. 
And I'm going to give you a couple of big words here. Exegesis versus eisegesis. So if you want to know how to spell those, if you're taking notes, exegesis versus eisegesis. And again, this is kind of a, um, you know, a, a Bible college type lesson. But I want to explain these things to you, these two different methodologies to you, so that you might understand a little bit more about how we do what we do and why we do it. Exegesis, uh, there's a definition here, because these, these are both, they're conflicting approaches to Bible study. Exegesis, defined, is the exposition or explanation of a text based on careful objective analysis. The word exegesis literally means to lead out of. That means that the interpreter is led to his conclusions by following the text. So in a sense, I mean, whenever I've thought about exegesis, I always think it sounds like exit Jesus. Not that he's left, but that he comes out of. You could, you know, just kind of to remember what it means. It's like we look at the scripture, we look at it uh, with all the wisdom that God has given, but we look at it in an analytical way and, and we, we look at it for what it says and the doctrine comes out of it. It, in a sense, exits from it into our brains. Amen? So that's exegesis. The, the teaching comes out of the scripture. The opposite approach, approach is what's referred to as eisegesis. It's defined as, as such. It's the interpretation of a passage based on a subjective, non-analytical reading. The word eisegesis literally means to lead into, which means the interpreter injects his own ideas into the text, making it mean whatever he wants. So, you get the difference? It's like with, with exegesis, you get the teaching from the text. It comes out of the text. With eisegesis, you've got some ideas of your own. Maybe the culture has some ideas and then you look at the text and you read into the text the things that are informed from outside sources. This is the problem that the Sadducees have. This is the problem that many teachers today have. And guys get on their hobby horse. They've got pet teachings and things. They come at the scriptures with outside things, things that they believe, the wisdom of man and all those things, and they, instead of, exegeting the the scripture instead of getting the doctrine from the text they put into the text and thus they mishandle the text and arrive at a misinterpretation or an error this is where it comes from exegesis is concerned with discovering the true meaning of the text text respecting its grammar syntax and setting eisegesis is concerned more with making a point a presupposed point So, we know what the Sadducees believe. We know that they've come to Jesus with a question, but we know that behind the question there is this set of beliefs. The question for us is, how did they arrive at their belief? How did they arrive at this whole idea that there is no spiritual thing, you know, there's there's no angels, there's no heaven, there's no, you know, all of this. How did they come at that? Well, Jesus' answer is, is very simple, right? He says, he says, you're in error. You're mistaken. He's, I'm sure he's gentle with them. But he's like, uh, you're mistaken. It needs to be said, right? He needed to say that. You're wrong. Sometimes we need to hear that. And then he goes on. He says, you don't understand the Scriptures. You know the Scripture. In fact, you're, you're basically recounting the essence of what Moses said, but you don't understand it. So many people today are like that, where they will know what the Scripture says, but they don't really understand what it means. And then he says, you don't know the power of God. You don't understand the power of God. I would just say this. When you take away the power of God, that is, all things supernatural and how God intervenes in the world with his own strength, his own power, and you approach the scriptures from a purely intellectual viewpoint, you will never arrive at correct doctrine. Right? Because you've set aside the very essence of who God is. When you set aside the very essence, the power of God, when you set all that aside, then you're looking at a spiritual work without the spirit. It doesn't work. You're not going to arrive at the truth. 
And so this is their problem. And he, he, he rightly says, you're in error. You, you don't understand. I like how one author put it in regard to the Sadducees and how they arrived at this. He says, simple faith gives way first to inextricable reasoning and finally to unmitigated skepticism. And I've seen people on this journey. Have you ever seen people on this journey where they're trying to become smart? Now, you know, it's like even pastors, I've seen this where it's like we don't we can't just read the scriptures. We can't just understand God from the scriptures. We have to be higher and higher and higher and higher educated. Now, I'm not against education. We ought to be educated, right? But it's an education sometimes that sets aside the power of God. Even how God interacts with man, how God's interacted in history, miracles, in fact, there's one popular teacher right now. He's, he's considered to be highly, highly intellectual. And yet he's out there, he's denying Adam. He's denying the existence of a literal Adam. And I've had some of my friends, are, they like this guy and they read his books and I'm like, are you kidding me? You're denying, that's like so important. Right? Like Adam is like the first man. Adam and Eve, this is important. You can't just allegorize away Adam. And yet this guy's, He's thought to be a great intellectual. And I would just say, he's like the Sadducees. He's on a slow drift to eventually he'll just deny all of the scriptures. Have to be very careful. Now, how does it work in our day? The whole idea of getting involved in doctrinal error. Again, looking at what Jesus said. He said, this is how you're mistaken. These two things, you don't understand the scriptures and you don't understand the power of God. I'll just pick one of my pet doctrines, one of my pet things, okay? So now I'm illustrating, just so you know, you know, I'm trying to teach this principle, but this is how it goes. One of the things that I think is super important for Christians is prayer. Like you guys will, you guys will hear me talk about that. I will talk about prayer until I die. Seriously, I just believe in the power of prayer. Now, I didn't come at that through some human philosophy, I came at it through Scripture, through reading the Scripture, through understanding the Scripture. The Bible talks about prayer all the time. It's like in every chapter, every, not every chapter, but, but in almost every book of the Bible, prayer is extolled. Just read the life of David. You'll see, you know, in the Psalms, he was praying, he was talking to God. We see the prayers of Daniel. <coughs> see the, the prayers of uh, Joshua. You know, Joshua prayed that the sun would stand still in Gibeon, and it did? Oh, people have trouble with that one. We see all through the New Testament, Paul talks about prayer. He, we have his literal prayers recorded, right? But then he's telling the church, hey, you ought to pray. You ought to pray without ceasing. Pray at all times. I want the men in every place to, to pray, lifting up holy hands. We see Jesus. What is he doing? He's, he's setting aside time. He gets away. Why? He prays. He's teaching the disciples to pray. Prayer is totally biblical. It's a very biblical practice. And yet, we find in our lives, not so much, right? And I'll just confess because I don't know, none of you are going to raise your hands, right? If I ask, who's not praying enough? We go through days or weeks or even long seasons of prayerlessness. It's a biblical doctrine. It's a teaching that the Bible is clear about. We ought to be people who are praying. Why don't we pray? And I would just say, it's these same two things. Number one, we don't believe in the power of God. We don't understand the power of God. What? We do too. We believe it. No, we don't. We have access. We have access to the God of the universe, the God who created all things. He's the author of life, He's the author of miracles. He can heal. He can bless, he wants to bless, he wants to heal, he wants to, and he has shown throughout history that he intervenes with humanity. He steps in. And he is, to some degree, although I would just say we don't completely understand it, there are times when we see God seem to be persuaded by men to do things. 
It's crazy. And yet we see it all through Scripture. And then we're quiet. We don't pray. Why? I would say because we don't fully understand the power of God. We don't fully understand or believe in the Scriptures. To the degree that we're prayerless, we haven't, we haven't fully adopted the doctrine of prayer. And so our practice is prayerlessness. And I would just say that's, that's definitely a practice that ought to be corrected. I'm just using that to illustrate this is how it happens. We simply take a diminished view of the power of God. Well, you know, I prayed that one time and my cat died anyway. God's not listening. No, seriously. I know that sounds silly, but as a child, I remember praying for that cat, Whiskers, and Whiskers died anyway. I had a diminished view of the power of God. It wasn't informed by Scripture. It wasn't accurate. I just had this thing that I made up, and I had a diminished view. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Do we believe that? Do you believe that? It ought to change the way we view this particular doctrine. Again, what am I talking about? I'm talking about our doctrine being informed by understanding the power of God and understanding the Scripture. The Scripture tells us to pray. As Christians, it ought to be something that we do more of. When we understand the power of God, when we understand the Scriptures, we see that prayer is extolled. It's encouraged over and over and over again. Now, if we set aside what the Scripture says, if we set aside that doctrine, we begin to have, and we have, it illustrates really that we have a diminished view of the power of God, and we arrive at error, even to the point where we say, ah, you know, I don't need to pray. Doctrinal errors are created by not looking at what the Scripture says and by not believing or understanding them. When those things are diminished, we substitute human intellect and we arrive at false doctrine or error. This is where the Sadducees were. You know, they just, they just looked at life, they looked at things, and the, certainly there was a culture of the day. And it was easy for them, just as it is in our day, to say, well, you know what? I don't really see God doing a whole lot. Right? And, and you hear the yammering that goes on out there in culture. Oh, you know, where is God? Why doesn't He do something? Right? We've set aside an understanding of the power of God. We've set aside the Scriptures. And so we can kind of adopt that same kind of mentality and will arrive at error just as they did. Now, the second thing, the second point here is how is doctrine tested? How is doctrine tested? Well, without getting into too much of the political weeds, I think, um, you know, this, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently about the Supreme Court and and that whole thing, and no matter where you stand on that particular issue or, or Brett Kavanaugh or anything like that, I don't want to get into the, the details of that, but one of the things that can be said about him as a person and, and how we uh, view that role of being a judge is that judges in our culture, in our day, are supposed to interpret the law. Right? They're, they're not intended to make the law. That's the, that's the job of the legislature, right? The elected officials are supposed to make the laws. The judge is supposed to interpret the law. Now, how do the judges interpret the law? They have to look at the law, right? They have to, they have to look at the case that's before them and then look at the law, and then they compare the two, and they decide what's wrong and what's right. Not arbitrarily, right? They're not supposed to judge arbitrarily, but they're supposed to, in this case, we have law. We have the Constitution, which is the foundation of our legal system. And so we, we hope to have, at least, a, a, a judge or judges that are 
looking at the Constitution and trying to figure out what does this document say because that's the foundation of our laws, right? It, it's the same for you and I. You, you, you know, if you want to know if something that you're about to do or something you're thinking about doing, whether it's right or wrong from a legal standpoint, you have to look to the law, right? And, and the law is the judge. Well, it's the same thing with the Scripture, with the, with the doctrine. It can only be rightly tested or rightly understood when we look at what the original authors wrote, what's there, what's in the text. We have what's called the golden rule of biblical interpretation. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense, lest it result in nonsense. Right? We, we look to the Scriptures and we say, well, what, what was intended here? Of course, with the Bible, we've got different forms of literature, right? You've got poetry, and you've got allegory, and you've got uh, narrative. You've got all these different forms, and so you have to take that into account. You have to take into account the culture and the language and all of these things. Nevertheless, you have to determine what, is, what it is that the Scripture is saying. When testing Christian doctrine, we have the foundation of the Scripture, and we've got to go to the Word of God, because it's where our faith and all of our teaching and doctrine originates. And so in this case, with the Sadducees, their error is an error where they don't believe in the things that the Bible clearly talks about. Even, you know, again, we're in, you know, the, the, you know, the end of the Old Testament era here, so they would have the Old Testament books of the Bible. Certainly, uh, we've got the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, is being uh, quoted here. And they looked at those things and they disregarded the resurrection, they disregarded the angels, they disregarded the idea of a spirit, and Jesus just plainly says, you're wrong. We would say, how judgmental. Right, seriously, that's what our culture would say. How dare you? Who makes you the judge? But this is Jesus we're talking about, right? And, and they've posed this question to him and he knows what's in their heart, he knows what they believe. And so he's able to judge. But look at what he does. And again, we're talking about how doctrine, how teaching is tested or can be tested. What does he do? He holds up Scripture. Not just the text of Scripture, but the intention of Scripture. He holds up the truth, scriptural truth. He says, look at verse 25. In answering their question, he doesn't, he doesn't take it head on, but he just says, when they rise from the dead... When they rise from the dead, what is he saying? Well, he's definitely talking about a scriptural principle, the resurrection. He says, they will be like the angels in heaven. He's espousing the truth of angelic beings. And then he goes for something that they would have certainly understood. They loved Moses, right? They believed in Moses. And so he quotes from Moses, Exodus 3, verse 6, where Moses is meeting with God there and he's seeing this supernatural burning bush. God's calling him to be the deliverer of the children of Israel out of Egypt. And, and God says to him, when Moses says, who am I going to say? You know, who are you? And God says, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. What does Jesus use? He uses scripture. He says, you guys would know this. You do know this. How could God, I mean, this is his reasoning, how could God be the God of the dead? He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And so what is God saying? He's saying these guys are alive. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive, even though they have passed away. So he's answering their question. He's challenging them. How is he testing their doctrine? By using Scripture. In Acts chapter 17, we read about Paul sharing the gospel in Thessalonica. Acts 17, 2 and 3 tells us about what he was doing and how he would do it. It says, according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths he reasoned from them, or with them from the Scripture. 
Notice that line. What was Paul doing as he's teaching the gospel? He's reasoning to people with the revealed word of God that they had, the scriptures of the day, the Old Testament. It says he's explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus who I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. So this was Paul's methodology. He goes to Thessalonica. He's teaching in the synagogue there. He's saying, listen, you guys understand the scripture. You, you know the Old Testament scripture. Let me show you. No doubt he's going to Isaiah 53 or someplace like that where he's saying, listen, look at this. It's talking about a suffering servant, a, a savior who would come, who's going to be mistreated, beaten and killed. That's Jesus, right? That's, that's all he's doing. He's reasoning from the scripture. They were in doctrinal error and he's challenging them by what the scripture says. This is how doctrine is tested. Whatever we believe, it can be tested by the word of God. He got into trouble there in Thessalonica as he got into trouble in the most places that he went. And so from there he went on to a town called Berea. And so we know the Bereans were we're well known because of this verse in Acts 17. It says, now these, referring to the Bereans, they were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. See what the Bereans were doing? The Bereans were doing, hopefully, what you do, right? Like, like I don't suppose on any given Sunday uh, well, I'm, not only do I not suppose I'm going to get away with anything, but I don't desire to get away with anything, but I do know that if I tried to foist some false doctrine on you, if I tried to, to teach you some pet thing of mine that I believed, I'd get called out, right? You would call me out, I hope, right? Someone would pummel me after church saying, what are you doing, right? Because we have the Scripture, and it's the, the thing that we use to measure what's right and what's wrong. This is what the Bereans were doing. This is why they were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians, because they were listening to Paul with open hearts and open minds, but they were looking at the Scripture and going, what is he talking about? Oh, yeah, it's right here. So Paul, all he was doing was reasoning, just like he did over and over. He's reasoning from the Scriptures, and they were receiving it, they were examining the scriptures to see if they were so. I would just say this to all the, anyone who's a skeptic. Oh, I don't believe the Bible. Da, da, da. You, you don't know anything about the Bible. Right? If you haven't approached it with an open mind and actually looked at what it says, that's how you arrive at error. They were noble-minded. They looked at it and they had great eagerness. They wanted to see if the things that Paul was saying were true. In Amos chapter seven, verse eight, the prophet writes, he said, the Lord said to me, what do you see, Amos? He evidently was given a vision, and, and I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, behold, I'm about to, put, about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. I love this verse. I love just the image of this verse that God says here, now, we know that the prophets, they were speaking to the nation that generally was in rebellion over and over and over again, right? And so God sent the prophets to correct them, to instruct them. We saw that in the parable, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, I think, about the, you know, God sending over and over. He sent different ones that were mistreated. But he, he said to Amos, I'm, I'm going to give a plumb line. You guys know what a plumb line is? If you don't know, it's a, it's a very simple instrument. It's a string with a heavy weight on the end of it, a non-magnetic weight at the end of it. And it's a tool by which a construction wor worker, a carpenter, when you hang the plumb line, you have a perfectly vertical line by which you can measure things. You can hold it up against a wall. Boy, I'll tell you, if you held a plumb line to the walls in this building, because it's an old building, because it's sagged here and there, you're going to find, right, that the, the line, the, the building is off. The line will always be straight. It's the thing by which you can measure things. And so God's saying, I'm going to give you a plumb line. I'm going to put it in the midst of my people Israel. The plumb line <clears throat> speaks of two things. Number one, it speaks of Christ. 
Jesus Christ is the plumb line, right? He's, he's the man, the Son of God, by whom we measure all things. But then he's the Word of God. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the Word of God. And so you have in him the revelation of God. He's the plumb line. His Word is the plumb line. And so if you want to test doctrine, if you want to find out what's true and what's right, what's straight and what's crooked, all you got to do is hold up the plumb line. What does the Word of God say? The plumb line tests every soul unmistakably, revealing every departure from accuracy, and it calls down judgment on the violator. This is what God was saying, I'm going to do. I'm going to show you guys where you're off. And here is Jesus talking to the Sadducees and saying, you're mistaken. It's not me who's mistaken, you're mistaken. Isaiah 28, 17, the Lord said, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the level. Then hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters will overflow the secret place. God's saying, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something. I'm going to bring in justice and it's going to be the measuring line. I'm going to bring in righteousness and it's going to be like a level. Same idea there. Righteousness, justice, Jesus, the word of God. It's not a human justice. Well, I'll tell you, when we, look to, when we look for justice in the human sphere, we get it wrong. We don't need human justice. We need divine justice, right? We need the justice that God gives. Not a human righteousness. We need divine righteousness. Amen? Boy, do we need it in our day. So many issues going on that are difficult for us to understand. All doctrine or belief must be tested by a standard, and that is the revealed Word of God. The Bible, as unpopular as this is, the Bible is the test of what's true and what's right. And the skeptic will argue, right? The skeptic will argue, it's, oh, you know, your Bible, it's just made up stories and things. If, you, if that's your argument, it's, a, it's an argument out of total ignorance, I had this discussion with somebody recently. I was really happy to have the discussion. I'm always game, by the way, to have that discussion. I was at a conference recently, and it's been a couple years, I guess, but uh, the apologist Josh McDowell was there. If you guys are familiar with Josh McDowell's ministry, he's all about evidence, right? He's, he likes to look for evidence that supports the scriptures, that supports our doctrine. And he was telling about a recent thing that's happened where um, they have found the scriptures in Egyptian death masks, which is like, what? You know, the Egyptians, they had these different things that they would do as part of their, part of their culture and religion, and they would, they would make funeral masks and different things. Well, they made them out of what would, we would call paper mache. After the Exodus, that is, after Israel had been enslaved, the Jews had been enslaved in Egypt, they left. They left a lot of things. They left a lot of their possessions. One of the things that they left behind was the scriptures. Right? They copied and recopied the scriptures. And they didn't take all of it, I guess, with them, but they left some of those things behind. Well, if you're an Egyptian and you're looking for paper mache material, the Jews left behind the scriptures. And so recently, in our day, due to technology and modern science, they're able to gather these Egyptian death masks and take them apart electronically. And you know what they found? The Scripture. They found the Scripture. And they peel them apart and they find them and they find they have found the Scripture over and over and over again. In fact, they're, you know, Josh McDowell is like they're buying these up on the black market and trying to get a hold of them because they contain the Scripture and they're in evidence. The, the Scripture that we have, insofar as the Old Testament is concerned, it's there, right? It hasn't changed. We go back to the original writings, you know, they have the manuscripts and they're all, science has only confirmed that as opposed to what the skeptic would say, oh, you know. It's like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. You're mistaken. 
You don't understand the power of God. Certainly in this case, you don't understand the power of God to preserve his own word, which he promised to do. He's done it. And all science does is back it up over and over and over again, right? I mean, you know, we think about God in terms of creation. It doesn't really matter how much more we discover. We can keep discovering more and more things, whether it's out in space or as we look in, you know, the smallest things in the human body. It screams there's a designer over and over and over again. There's an intelligence. There's a design. It's God. How are errors corrected? We know that they're tested by the Word of God. God's Word is the standard. It's the plumb line. It's the level. Well, in order to correct an error, you've got to apply truth to what is wrong. We have to exchange our own thoughts and our own opinions for what God says. This is exactly what He challenges the Sadducees to do. He gives the truth from the scripture, right? Look again at verse 25. He says, when they rise from the dead, he says, they're like angels in heaven, right? And then he quotes this Exodus 3, 6. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and God of Jacob. These are truths that Jesus affirms, right? As he's answering their question, he says, these things are all true. They gotta be challenged. You're mistaken. You don't understand these things. But it's not just that he tells them these things or goes over these things, in order for the, tr- the error to be corrected, these things have to be received, right? They have to be believed. At some point, you've got to say, oh, oh, that thing. Oh, you mean those kids running across the street, if they get hit by a car, they're not going to become an angel? It's like, it's like that's, a, that's a doctrinal error. The Bible doesn't teach us that. It's just something some grandma made up. <laughs> you know, whatever in order to receive correction, you have to apply the truth. It's of no effect if it's not received. And so we don't know the story of how the Sadducees received all of this. Probably eventually after the cross, after the resurrection, they were, some of them, no doubt, were believing. The reason why they had trouble with it, though, was because Exactly what Jesus said. They didn't believe in the power of God. They didn't believe or they didn't understand the scriptures. But also, they didn't believe in Jesus' authority. And that's really a big issue. Look at what he says. He says, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry or are given in marriage, but they're like the angels in heaven. So in in essence, this is his answer to their question. He, he's dealing with the premise, the false doctrine that they actually have that's unspoken. Now he kind of answers their question. And, and he just, he affirms what we already know and believe. He says, number one, when they rise from the dead, they rise. He's affirming the resurrection. There is more to life than what we have here and now. He's saying that very clearly. When they rise, not if. When they rise. And then he goes on, he says, Basically, there's no marriage in heaven. Now, he's affirming a couple of things. Number one, this is a reality that we know in the afterlife that marriage is not an important thing. It's not a happening thing. I'm sorry, honey. You know, we're married now. We won't be married then. It doesn't matter. We're married to Christ. So he's affirming the doctrine of heaven. He's saying there is more. There is an afterlife. It's going to be different. Right? You can get a whole lot of doctrine from the things that he says. Heaven exists. He, he affirms angels. He says, we are like angels in heaven. He's clearly saying we are not angels. You don't become an angel. We, we need to have this. Now, if you've got some folk religion kind of thought, you know, refrigerator magnet kind of mentality, you might think, oh, we become angels. No, you don't. Right? So the error that you may hold has to be corrected by what the Scripture says. And in this case, it's Jesus. He's kind of the authority. Wouldn't you say? Again, we're going to deal with that authority issue next week. But here, for us who believe in Him, we recognize Him. He's the Son of God. He is the very Word of God, and He's applying these things. He is the authority, and He's saying clearly, they're going to rise. There's no marriage in heaven. Heaven does exist, by the way. Angels exist, by the way. You are not angels, and you don't become angels. 
Next question. You know, it's like, you know, he's correcting the error, but the correction of the error depends upon the authority that you give him. Because if you don't give him authority, you're not going to change the way you think. It's important for us to understand this. We have to, we must take those things to him. Let the word of God speak, test, right? And then be willing to let him correct our false doctrine. These days, you know, it's very popular. It's, we've turned it into a national pastime to defy authority. At every level, seriously, at every level, we defy authority. There's no authority. We like to be our own authority, right? I mean, this is just a, it's just a cultural thing. Everyone's marching and screaming and, you know. And without getting into, you know, politics, you know, there's... Anyway, I won't get into it. But we defy authority. And it's important for us as Christians to understand that when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to the spiritual things that we believe... There is an authority, and we've got to submit to it. We have a, in our culture, we have a diminished view of Scripture. Again, we don't understand the power of God. We don't understand the Scripture. We have a diminished view of Scripture. We have a diminished view of the church. Seriously, we have a diminished view of the church. People don't think it's important. Today, and I'm not, I don't, not referring, referencing anybody in particular, but you know what? The football game is more important to people. It just is for a lot of people. It's like sport is more important. That's a diminished view of the church, of something for which God is very, very clear about. We have a diminished view of pastoral authority. Not that I seek authority or any kind of power, but, but pastors these days are easily written off because we're just guys, you know, right? Just, I'm just up here spouting opinion. And so in all these things, we have a diminished view of the power of God, a diminished view of the authority of God and of His Word. One of the popular trends in our day, even amongst professing Christians, is the ditching of church. People do it all the time. And I, I'm not, you know, not talking about anybody in particular, but there is a trend, especially among young people. I don't need to go to church, right? I can watch it online. Now, we publish stuff online, but we do it because you're sick sometimes or you're, you're on vacation and we want you to be able to keep up. It's not so you can stay home and go to church in your pajamas. That's convenient, right? But it's a diminished view of the importance of gathering together. It's not informed by the scriptures. It's informed by the culture. It's informed by your own laziness, maybe. Speaking to you who are watching online. <laughs> In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, Don't forsake your own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The scripture couldn't be any clearer. We see it in practice. What was the early church doing? You know, people say that all the time. Oh, you know, I don't need to go to a formal church because I can just do church at home because, you know, the, the early church, they did things differently. What do you see when you look at the scriptures in, re in regard to the early church? They were constantly getting together. They were getting together to pray. There was no sense that they were isolated in their homes watching it on YouTube. Right? They were participating together. That's the whole intention. And we must believe that. That's where we get our doctrine about the, 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 our ecclesiology, it's called, from the Scriptures. We're supposed to gather together. In fact, we're to not forsake that. We're not to let go of that. Because we need to be together to encourage one another. Now, it's a, it's, it's a strange irony, isn't it? that we can receive teaching in a non-assembling kind of way, but at the same time diminish the very teaching that we say we want to receive. We can set aside the power of God. We can set aside what the Scripture says. How do you correct the error? That's the question. Well, I would just say this. The Scripture is not wrong. I don't care what it is that's going on out there in the culture. I don't care what it is that science is telling you, whatever's on the Discovery Channel or whatever. The Scripture is not wrong. 
You are. We are. The plumb line is accurate. It has always been accurate. It will always be accurate. And everything must be measured by it. And where things are out of line, are out of whack, it's not the scripture that needs to be reinterpreted. It's our interpretation that needs to be corrected. Amen? Amen. And we have to be yielded to that. In the same way that Sadducees, they're confronted with the truth. As they come to Christ, they're confronted with the truth. What are you going to do? Are you going to hang on to your false doctrine? Or are you going to give it up? The only way it's corrected is through repentance. Right? The only way false doctrine is corrected is through acknowledging that there is an authority. It's not me. Right? There is an authority. It's not you. Jesus is the authority. The Word of God is the authority. And where we're out of line, where we're out of whack, we just have to say, Lord, forgive me, and receive the correction. I have to do it all the time. Do you guys find that it's true? There are things that you adopt. There's beliefs or practices that you adopt that that they they come to us. Maybe it's some silly thing like my mom's doctrine of angels. It's got to go. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. I want to believe what the Scripture says. And not only do I want to believe what the Scripture says, I want to make application in my life. I want to follow it. And that involves a constant sense of repentance from my own way of thinking. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, I thank you that even in this exchange with the Sadducees, we see these great lessons. Lord, they were so close and yet so far away as they had an encounter with you, God in the flesh. And they, in a sense, came to you with their mocking question, trying to trap you. And you were so gentle and so tender with them, just bringing correction, bringing the word to bear in their lives. Lord, I pray that we, as believers, as those who call themselves believers, Lord, I pray that we would be yielded to your word in deed and in practice. Lord, that we would take a look at our own lives and how our lives measure up, both to your word and to the example that you've given us. And Lord, wherever it's off, wherever it's out of whack or not level, Lord, will you correct us and may we receive that correction and may our doctrine, may the things that we believe come from you, come from your word. Lord, we're thankful for science. We're thankful for technology. We're thankful for all the things in our world in a creative sense, that have have given us wisdom. But we recognize that all of those things, Lord, when interpreted properly, they just affirm the truth of your word. May we bend, may we yield to your truth. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord.